go ahead and get started and talk about the Crest. So we talk about the uh, the Crest boiler. It, it covers a couple of models right now, and that's why the screen is here to kind of so you know which model you have. Um, as you look at them, the Crest covers what we refer to as a dual fan and a single fan model. Um, if your model number ends in a zero, you have two fans. If your model number ends in a one, you have a single fan. And it, it's not a BTU by BTU because you could have a two and a half million BTU dual fan and you could have a two and a half million BTU single fan. And that change was a rolling change, took place a couple of years ago as we transitioned to the single fan, single burner model. And it was really because of a change in the code. Initially, the code really talked about what your amount of turndown that you were allowed to have. Um, and when the crest rolled out, it came out at a 25 to one turndown. And you really weren't supposed to do that in a single gas train. Um, so the, the initial versions had dual gas trains, dual fans. It's a single burner um, that they both went into. But, and that's really what the, what the change was in those. Um, for the most part, operation is very similar as we talk about it. Cleaning is, is similar. Again, it's much simpler on a single fan model than it is in a dual fan model. Um, so let's just kind of get into it. But just know what your model number is um, and know your serial number. It's going to give us a lot of information, whether you need a part for a PM or whatever you're looking for. All right. So there's the crest right there. Now, also throw in there, there are three different control screens at this point in time. This boiler's been out long enough to kind of roll through some, some enhancement and upgrades. The newest display screen actually goes, will retrofit onto the earliest versions. So if you actually needed to replace a screen today, the screen you're going to get is the new screen. Um, you're not actually going to get the old screen. You'll, you'll get the new one. And it, again, it's a plug and play. In fact, Dave, who I was talking to at the beginning of this, we just upgraded two of his really original version Crest and put the newest display screen on it. So it is, it's possible to do that. Um, and just a real quick side view, it's really not a sales presentation, but just get you guys to understand looking at this. So the Crest is a down fired um, fire tube style heat exchanger. And when we come out of the PowerPoint, I have a small fire tube uh, heat exchanger. We'll just talk about that briefly. But if you look at it, there's the combustion chamber on the top, and we're pushing the flue gases down through those tubes. And the tubes are wave formed is what they call them. Why is that important to you as far as service and maintenance? Well, the velocity does a good job of keeping that clean. And when you look at those from the top, there's a pretty big opening as you look down in there. Um, you know, maybe a two, two inch round opening. You might think, hey, I can, I can stuff a brush in here. You really can't because we get to that wave forming. The purpose of that is just the velocity of the air through there. It, it'll scrub itself. It will also, that's how we're getting that heat transfer as it kind of ping pongs going down through that. So that, that's really the point of, of looking at that picture. Um, a very small combustion chamber on the top. But the thing about that picture, and I'm going to hit this several times because it's incredibly important is the flame on the burner is really tight to that burner. In this case, that's what one would look like at low fire. And we have some pictures we'll show you, but I just want to keep, you know, kind of reiterating, hey, the, the, the burner glows at low fire and it stays really tight there, all right? So we're gonna get into some components and controls. Don't worry, the creepy guy there at the bottom hopefully is not in your boiler. Um, but if he is, it's your issue at this point in time, no longer ours. Um, the boiler you see in the middle, that is a two fan model right there. And there's two, two gas air arms, two fans, and it drops down into the single burner, which you see on the right hand side of your screen. We're going to get a little more into that as we move along. Just a, that's again what it looks like right there. Push down through the heat exchanger itself sits on this condensate collection um, box, if you will, down at the bottom. So as we push our flue gases down through, they make a turn and they come up through that, uh, through that change in the, in the venting there. Now, one of the conversations that we have a lot of times with down-fired style heat exchangers is my condensate is really dirty. So as you look at this, 
on the uh, on the bottom left hand side, you'll see that flu that condensate outlet. So just picture my flue gas is pushing down through that heat exchanger, down this direction, hitting the bottom, making the turn, and coming up. Well, when this happens, all those leftover products, the combustions that you normally see in a heat exchanger get dropped off here and the condensate washes them out. That's why when you see a boiler of this style, the condensate seems to be very dirty. And it's a fact of we're pushing it out as opposed to you cleaning it out. So that's why the condensate looks much dirtier. Um, just a little added maybe maintenance uh, for you guys in the field is we're gonna wanna make sure that we're cleaning our condensate neutralization kits and our condensate traps because that stuff's coming out with the boiler. Or I should say with the flue gases. Real quick, there's that waveform. Um, so that's why it's a fire tube. In this picture, you see the fire in the tube. Now, if you actually had fire like that in the tube, you have other issues. Um, it's a great visual. But there's really the fire doesn't blow down through there. As I said before, it stays on that burner. It's just the heat moving down through that. Okay. And now we're taking a look in that heat exchanger uh, combustion chamber. So when you do a service, you pull the burner out and you look down in, as you see those tubes, you might kind of be inclined to say, oh, I could get a brush in there. Just trust me, you can't get a brush in there. So it's a little misleading. Um, you know, as people look at it, we want to make sure you're not trying to, you know, put a brush in there. Now, just in these side-by-side -side pictures, left-hand side, the burner and the top plate are installed. Right-hand side, um, burner and top plate aren't even there. That's a brand new heat exchanger getting ready to, to really be put into service. As a general rule, we don't take that top plate off. We take the burner out, but we don't take the top plate out, mainly because those heat exchanger combustion chambers really don't require that type of maintenance. If they have to, obviously you can take them out, um, but it's just something that is a general rule you want to be cautious with. And when you put it back together, because they can be some large top plates, is making sure that you're pressure testing those. And we'll go over how we do that a little later on in the thing. There's that flu collector. Um, I just want to touch on it here. There's a, a fault you could get. Um, it's, a, it's an ADC controller error. That fault generally means that this right here got wet. And a source of that at times is stainless steel venting um, leaking down onto that sensor and getting it wet and you can get an ADC controller error. If you see that on there, you want to go right to the back of your boiler and look for moisture. Now, while we're, while we're talking about that and looking at that flu collector there, so two other maintenance items that are important. Um, when stainless steel manufacturers manufacture their stainless steel, they don't always have the same diameter on the outside. Always the inner wall is the thing, but the outside diameters tend to be different. So definitely check with your manufacturer, your venting manufacturer, does it fit right in there? Like, uh, I believe it's Shebler venting, requires a dual gasketed system to really fit in there. If not, you get some leakage around there. Um, we're, the, uh, we're the rep for Centrotherm as well. Centrotherm makes an adapter specific for these products. Um, so you want to make sure you're putting that in there before you transition to Centrotherm. So that flu collar is designed around a specific, because that's provided to us by Fast and Seal, it fits their stainless steel vent. Doesn't mean you can't use others, just make sure that it's being done right. What that tends to show up as in the field and the call is, hey, I think I have some leaking. And what you have is some of that flue gas maybe weeping around a little bit and condensing outside of there and leaking on there. So definitely something to, to look for. All right, condensate collection system. That's what I was talking about. We tend to see these very dirty out here. And that's just, it's doing a good job of cleaning everything out through and, and dumping it there. Notice this difference in elevation though, that is important um, to allow for drainage going out. All right, let's get into the burner. Let's get into what we're looking for. So we're looking at a burner firing along here. This is, this is down at, at Lockenvar's factory. They actually have um, burners that are outside of the cabinet and they fire them. But the point here is that that's, that's a burner cooking right along. That's, you know, probably a full fire for that boiler right there. 
This was the original dual fan model. And what we're looking at is that blue flame, because it's turned blue at high fire, and then all these orange specks in the background. But the flame is tight uh, to the burner. It's not big, long, wicking flames. And one of the reasons we want to stay away from the long wicking fl flames, aside from that, it's poor combustion. But on these dual fan models, we have two flame sensors. And under low fire operation, only this bottom portion of my burner is lit. So this guy's the one that's seeing the, the flame. When I really move up to high fire and we light off the second side of the, the second gas train, this part lights and there's also a piece that goes down here and now it's sensing flame. Well, if my flame is lazy and it's wicking away, this flame sensor over here can sense it. That's that one on the left hand side. And then we're gonna get a basically a flame out of sequence. Uh, oh. Now, one thing right here, this run cool technology. Um, we also have this Alchemesh outer coating. I believe that could be a made up word, but it sounds really cool um, for what we really use to put on the outside of our stainless steel burner tube. Run cool technology is the fact that, and they do this at the factory because they're in the South and they're, they're a little crazy. They'll shut that burner off and you could actually walk over and put your hand on top of it. The, the burner is, is, it's warm, but it's cool to touch. And that gives some of the longevity of the burners. Now, if you're not maintaining it and you allow this burner to get, you know, caked up with junk and run and run and run, usually it'll shut itself down to protect itself. But you don't want that flame falling back on the burner. We want to keep it off the burner. And that actually adds to the longevity of the, of the burner life. All right. Crest burner ignition system. This right here, this is specific to that two fan model. And there's my igniter over here. And then this is where I was talking about. This is your first stage of it. And I hate to say first stage, but up to about 25%. And this flame sensor is sensing flame. This one should not be. Then in a kind of a Dukes of Hazard type fashion, when we light off that second stage, we basically just open that gas valve. Um, this, get, this is already lit. And we light the rest of the burner off the... Uh, off the flame that's already there. So we don't re-spark that second time in this model. And, and, I, and I stress this model. When we get to the next model, you'll see a little change in that, okay? So it's, it's there. Um, wanna stress this, it's important. Behind this area, there's a shield and the design of it, and I got a picture of it. But again, in cleaning and servicing, getting this area clean is important. And there's, it, it's kind of a cruddy view of it, but that's the shield behind here. And that's done so that there is no flame from, there's no gas from behind coming out here and lighting. But when you're cleaning, if you're not cleaning real good behind this shield, and I got a slide that'll show us how to get up in there, we might not get a good burn here and we're not gonna sense the flame. The rest of our burner could be lighting up, but we don't see it right there. And there it is, there, there's looking, one is looking down from the top and that's there on your left hand side. This is looking up from the bottom. So when I clean my burner and we clean these, you know, from the outside and the inside, it's making sure this area is clean. And you can actually see this particular burner, uh, that area there isn't really clean. Um, so that was gonna lead to some flame failure issues right there. And it was really where it doesn't sense that, the flame on that second, uh, sensor. All right. There's our gas air delivery arms. A little piece of information about this is there's no flapper valves in there, which means that when this one's running at low fire, the smaller fan, we keep this fan idling along. And that's done to prevent any sort of flue gases from recirculating back down. Okay. Along the way here, we have a couple of switches. Those are our proving switches, if you will. And on initial pre-purge, when both fans go to full fire, these switches will sense that both fans are running. Now, after we light and the, these begin to drop down, those sensors come out of play, those switches, and we move over to our sensors right over here on the gas air arms, and those sensors right there are sensing temperature. And what they're looking at is the temperature in those sensors should be consistent. So if this fan wasn't running, 
I would start to see elevated temperatures from the heat of the, of the burner coming down here, shut my boiler down. We're also looking at the fact of we're monitoring these fans as well. So there's a couple of things that go on at that time. These sensors here are referred to as your pre-mix sensors. They're on the side of those, those air arms. All right. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about negative regulation, combustion, and then I've got a display out here when we get to that. But basically, we use fan suction pressure to pull gas through the valve. And in all of our products, in all Lockenbar, you'll find this exact same thing. You'll find a Venturi with an orifice. And here it's got a small orifice on this end. As the air moves across, it creates a negative pressure here, which then when the gas valve opens, I'm going to pull the gas through here in, and I'm going to create the mixture. All right. <clears throat> so there's our blowers. Um, we'll, generally, if I do the other classes, we talk about using the blower to pressurize the unit. Important to know with the crest, these have relays. So if the boiler is in alarm, the relays disable and there's no power to the, uh, to the fans. So if you're going to use your fan to, to pressure test it, you have to make sure the boiler is not in alarm. There's just another look at that dual gas train. So getting into the gas train itself, and hammer on this just a little bit, that our gas trains are the same. If it's a 55,000 BTU boiler, or if it's a 6 million BTU boiler, all the components are there. You have your Venturi, which mounts the side of the fan, which has just kind of been taken out here to, to clean it up. Venturi creates its negative pressure um, right here on the instrument side to it. And then we basically draw our air in through, right along here, and we pull the gas up through the gas valve and in. <clears throat> Same thing in the, uh, in, the, in the larger gas train. On these, we transition to a Dung's valve on our larger ones, Honeywell gas valves on the smaller ones generally, and um, on the smaller gas trains. High pressure gas, high gas pressure regulators. So one of the challenges is, is technology of your boilers has moved faster than the regulator manufacturers. So when we start talking about 25 to one turndown in, in large boilers, that's a big range for the regulator. So one of the challenges that regulators can cause is not being able to respond quick enough. And with a rotary meter, you can get stacking of your pressure. And that's that bottom line there, that lockup pressure. And that leads to some nuisance high gas pressure switch alarms. So it's really important that those gas pressure regulators get sized correctly. We talk about that is if I have a 3 million BTU boiler, I want a gas pressure regulator that can handle between 9 and 12 million BTUs. The reason we do that is we don't want that gas pressure regulator opening up fully. So if it's fully open, it takes it longer to close. <clears throat> and it's the spring closing it. It's not a servo solenoid activated regulator or it, like our gas valves do that close quickly. And if a, a rotary meter is behind it and that thing doesn't close fast, we're going to see some stacking of the, of the gas pressure there. So if we oversize those gas pressure regulators, definitely works a lot better by keeping them from opening a lot. Um, and that's going to apply to any of the new style um, boilers you get into with these gas pressure, these you know gas valves inside them, these fast acting gas valves. Now, people get kind of excited, like, wait, three to four sizes are multiplying the BTUs. It's usually one size increase in a regulator. It's not a lot. And we definitely want to make sure that you have a bubble-type lock-up regulator. We don't want an appliance regulator that can actually, will eventually bleed the pressure through. It's got to be a lock-up style uh, gas pressure regulator. A lot of issues that we run into are generally regulator-related um, issues. Make sure you get them 10 linear feet away from the appliance. When you have multiple boilers, in the manual we talk about, we really want to see a regulator per boiler. Because you think about it, I've got you know, a job with four, six million BTU boilers. You know, I got 24 million BTU boilers. That's a huge turndown. And the regulators just can't, the, that are out there today, really can't respond to that like they need to. Uh, 
So maintenance item here. It's not a you know it's not a cigarette butt removal system, but it does a darn good job at doing that. Um, <clears throat> just picture how much velocity of air, how many CFMs we're pulling with some of these bigger uh, bigger boilers. So we definitely don't want to have the smoking section right by the air intakes of the boilers. Um, think about where they are. We have a school installation where the air intakes are right on the front walkway to the school. We do a phenomenal job of picking up the sand and anything that the kids throw in there as they're walking by because we were all kids once too and that's a challenge. You know, if I could throw bubble gum into it or whatever it is, you know, get it caught in the airstream and watch it get sucked in there. So definitely things to think about, making sure that these have screens on them. Because anything you throw in there ends up in your burner. Your burner will collect it for you. All right. Circling back to flame on the, uh, on the burner. So this is a, a, a dual fan model. And so we've lit that top band and this is at low fire. And again, fire is the wrong term because it's a glow. It's an infrared glow almost. Um, and, it's, it's, and with these, with a crest, especially a dual fan, your combustion setup is more, what does the flame look like? What is the boiler reading for a flame signal? And then make sure your combustion numbers are in the ballpark. Um, it's really not, don't take the manual out and say, I'm going to adjust it to what the manual says. Now, in the reality of a crest, you should almost never adjust a gas valve. The crest should have all gotten a factory startup. There's really nothing that gets the gas valve out of whack. The gas valve itself, the combustion can get out of whack, and mainly that's just from one that needs a, you know, a PM. So where people get in trouble is they start trying to adjust their gas valve. Um, they'll look at it and say, well, the manual says it's here and I'm like a half a point percent off, I'm gonna adjust it. Probably don't. They've all been set, they've been tuned, they've been cleared of any noise issues and things like that. And this is specific to those, those dual fan models. So here it is, I'm still on gas valve one, I've ramped it up, now my blue, my flame has turned blue. I've still got my orange specs behind it. I've got a little bit longer in there, but I'm still, I'm, I'm a consistent length of the flame. It's not a really big flame jumping off of there. So just really important that you, you know, you see and kind of look at these, these things. Yeah, and I realize a lot of times we're by ourselves. Um, if you can have a second person there with you um, on a crest, and a lot of that is you just need somebody to touch the buttons, you know, and that could be, a, uh, you know, an on-site guy. It, it could be the maintenance guy, whatever it is, it's, you need them to transition from high to low or, that's just a day you're going to get your exercise, climbing down off the ladder and, and climbing back up uh, it can certainly be done. But, you know, their job is going to be usually when I go out on with the guys, that's my job. They tell me, push this button, push that button, push the next button. Um, and somebody gets to do that so that they don't have to climb down and, and up many times. So now we've transitioned. We have both sides of our burner going. We're at low fire and you see that nice orange glow. A little bit of blue Corona there on that, but it, it, again, it's an orange glow. If you have blue at low fire, you, you're, you got something going on with your combustion there. And then when we ramp up, there's our orange specks in the background, and there's our blue. That's what we're looking for. So when you talk about, and we'll start back to combustion, when we're in that dual fan model. What we're really looking for is how does my flame look what do I have for a flame signal? And I'll get to that in just a second. And make sure your CO is, is low. So you, that's, that's really doing that. And your numbers are somewhere in the range ballpark that we give you. Now, what are your flame signals? We want to be in the teens a, a lot. Now, down at low fire, we could drop down into the single digits, um, seven, eight. But generally, these things are going to give us a nice flame signal in the teens. And that's where we want to we want to be and let them go. So consider yourself eight to 15 um, on your flame signal for those. Again, we're about the dual fan model and you know, you're going to have a good steady burn. You want to listen for any noise. Um, one thing about the crest is you really almost in many of them, you can't even hear the fan and you definitely shouldn't hear the burn. Okay. Just a nice quiet running boiler, which is surprising for boilers of, you know, this size and, 
and BTU output. Circling back again, can't stress it enough, making sure that we're getting clean behind that shield, okay? And that's here, and that's really putting your, you're gonna reach in this part of your uh, burner with your uh, compressor air hose, and you're actually gonna push up through there and make sure that we, we blow all that out. And you almost wanna try and ricochet it off here, hit that, and bring it back down. A little bit of a challenge, but it can be done, but making sure that you get that clean and you might spend almost as much time right there as you are cleaning the rest of the burner. Take your time because you don't want to have to take it out again and redo it. All right, uh, we're going to jump over to a, just a video on getting that, that burner out. And there she goes. Let's make sure I'm on the right page. And close that one. My new share right here. Oh, it goes back to me. Still trying to make my technology work right. Sometimes I outsmart myself. There it is. All right, so this is jumping up onto Lock and Bar U. We've got some video tutorials up here. And we're just going to take a look at some of the Crest ones. Now, this is right here. That's that single blower model. We go down here, and we're getting into our dual blower. So we're going to go ahead with the burner removal and cleaning video and take a look at it. Burner removal and cleaning. The information contained in this video is intended as an aid to a qualified installing contractor or service technician. It is not intended to replace the installation or service manuals that are supplied with the equipment. Grasp the upper front panel at the bottom sides. Pull the panel away and up from the boiler. Grasp the lower front panel at the top sides. Pull the panel away and up from the boiler. Locate the on-off switch on the lower left side of the control panel. Turn the switch to the off position. Turn off the main gas supply to the boiler at the main manual gas valve. Remove the top access panel by pulling up on the handles and lifting away. Remove the four Phillips head screws securing the top back panel to the boiler. Remove the panel from the boiler. Remove the four bolts and nuts from each gas air manifold. Remove the five nuts securing the gas air manifold to the burner. Carefully lift up and remove the gas air manifold from the burner. A gasket is used to seal between the gas air manifold and the burner. Care must be taken not to tear or damage the gasket. If the gasket is damaged or torn, then it must be replaced. For the 3 and 3.5 million BTU models, remove the eight nuts securing the burner to the heat exchanger door. Pull the burner up and away from the boiler. Use caution when removing the burner to prevent damage to the refractory mounted on the inside of the heat exchanger door. A gasket is used to seal between the burner and the heat exchanger door. Care must be taken not to tear or damage the gasket. If the gasket is damaged or torn, then it must be replaced. Inspect the burner for any physical damage to the surface of the burner. If the burner surface is damaged, the burner must be replaced. If no damage is observed, 
Clean the burner by using compressed air to blow through the surface of the burner. Reinstall the burner with the burner gasket back into the heat exchanger door. For the 3 and 3.5 million BTU models, reinstall the 8 nuts securing the burner to the heat exchanger door. Do not over tighten the nuts when reinstalling. Tighten the nuts to a torque setting of no more than 6.2 foot pounds. Reinstall the gas air manifold and any gaskets back into the burner. Reinstall the five nuts securing the gas air manifold to the burner. Reinstall the four bolts and nuts from each gas air manifold. Do not over tighten the nuts when reinstalling. Tighten the nuts to a torque setting of no more than 6.2 foot pounds. Turn on the main gas supply to the boiler at the main manual gas valve. Turn the on off switch to the on position. Press the main menu button to bring up the main menu screen. From the main menu screen, press the service button. To access the service screen, the installer passcode must be entered correctly first. The installer passcode is 5309. Using the keypad, enter the passcode into the display. When finished, press the Enter button. Once accessed, the service screen will allow the control module to override any previous heat demands and operate at a selected firing rate. To place the boiler into service mode, press the green Start button. While in service mode, the control module will ignore all other demands. However, all safeties will remain active. If no other buttons are pushed, the control module will automatically revert back to its original state after the service mode delay has expired. The default time for the service mode delay is 40 minutes. The boiler will light and modulate to its low fire operating condition. Press the Total Boiler Maximum Input button. Once the boiler has modulated up to 100%, use a leak test solution to check all connections for leaks. All right, so there, as they're walking through it, it, I stop it right there because they fire the boiler to check for leaks. And really our desire is <clears throat> use that fan, pull that uh, pulse width modulation signal off the fan, let the fan run. And then what we're looking for is obviously do your leak test. They also put the, the insulation on the top of the heat exchanger first. We want to check for leaks with that insulation off of the heat exchanger. I think you're just going to get a little better uh, better look at things by doing that. Jump back into a little bit of this PowerPoint and we're going to share that one right there. Maybe. And there we go. All right. So we got through that. All right, so now we're gonna look at the single fan model. So in this one, it's just a wide open burner. You may see some newer ones or that we've put a baffle plate in there, which is gonna look like a cross pattern, pattern in there. Now in this one, we just have a single igniter and a single flame rod that are really gonna, well, we actually take that back. We have the two flame rods still, but we're still looking at just the one, the one burner. It's the same manufacturing, Technology there that run cool alchemical outer coating on this one. A couple things that are added. So now we've gone to a single fan. We've added an air metering valve, and that really helps that fan adjust for that large turndown of the boiler. At the initial um, startup of the boiler, that air metering valve cycles, and the boiler has to see that. And there's a switch in there 
and that's your air metering time air meter timing switch that will be in there now we're looking at the gas train now I, this is a six million btu gas train so kind of went with the big one but as we look at it there's my air metering valve is here this side over here is my venturi kind of drop down here that venturi pulls into my gas air arm and it picks up this gas valve and this gas valve now here's the difference we only use one gas valve at a time on a single fan version again up to that lower firing rates maybe 25 percent or so i'm running on this small gas valve when we transition i'm going to switch over to this gas valve now how we make that transition though is kind of important to note this the fan will still be running this gas valve will shut off this one will turn on and we re-spark um, so there's a second spark in ignition sequence when we're looking at the single fan uh, gas train and on the larger ones we actually have a, a solenoid this is kind of required a solenoid shut off right there all right we're going to jump back into into videos hopefully I get a little smoother transition this time when I go back um, and we're going to take a look at the burner removal video for the single fan version. Go to that. And there we are. So now we're here in the single blower model. And let's take a look at how we get into this one. It's much easier. <laughs> Begin by removing the top access panel by pulling it up and away from the unit. Then remove the lower access panel by pulling it up and away from the unit. Turn the power switch to the off position. Turn off the main gas supply to the boiler at the main manual gas valve. Remove the top access panel by pulling upon the handles and lifting up and away from the unit. Remove the eight nuts securing the manifold cover to the manifold. Carefully lift up and remove the manifold cover. A gasket is used to seal between the manifold cover and the manifold. Care must be taken not to tear or damage the gasket. If the gasket is damaged or torn, then it must be replaced. Remove the 10 nuts securing the burner to the manifold. Some units will have a metal retaining ring securing the burner. If the ring is present, carefully lift it up and out of the burner manifold. Pull the burner up and away from the boiler. A gasket is used to seal between the burner and manifold. Care must be taken not to tear or damage the gasket. If the gasket is damaged or torn, then it must be replaced. Use caution when removing the burner to prevent damage to the refractory mounted on the inside of the combustion chamber door. Inspect the burner for any physical damage. If the burner surface is damaged, the burner must be replaced. If no damage is observed, clean the burner by using compressed air to blow through the surface of the burner and a vacuum to collect any debris. Be sure every port is clear of debris before placing the burner back into the unit. Inspect the combustion chamber for any soot deposits or dirt accumulation. Using a vacuum, remove any loose debris from the combustion chamber. Brush the combustion chamber surface and flue tube entry points using a nylon brush. Remove the condensate drain line from the condensate trap and route directly to a drain. Rinse out debris from the heat exchanger with a low pressure water supply. Revacuum the combustion chamber to remove any remaining debris. Once the cleaning is completed, reconnect the condensate drain line to the condensate trap. Then reinstall the burner with the burner gasket back into the boiler. Reinstall the tin nuts securing the burner to the manifold. Do not over tighten the nuts when reinstalling. Tighten the nuts to a torque setting of no more than 8 foot pounds. Reinstall the manifold cover and gasket to the manifold. Reinstall the 8 nuts securing the manifold cover to the manifold. Do not over tighten the nuts when reinstalling. Tighten the nuts to a torque setting of no more than 8 foot pounds. Turn on the main gas supply to the boiler at the main manual gas valve. Turn the on-off switch to the on position. Press the menu parameters icon to enter the parameters menu screen. All right, so again, that same thing of where we're going to pressure test it. We like to pressure test it with it off. Um, use the fan. 
once you've pressure tested it and you're good, you don't have any leaks, then go ahead and run it. And you certainly might want to bubble test it again, just to make sure that nothing's kind of changed uh, in that, in that time period. All right. So I'll talk a little bit about the parts and pieces that, are, that I've kind of got here um, right now. Go ahead and just make sure that this, there we go. Um, so what we're looking at is, so this is that single, single burner. Um, now, kind of important to note, you may find in your version, there's a little notch here. So initial design of this, we actually used a little, uh, I guess we'll call it a little pilot valve, if you will, for that transition. That wasn't as reliable as was needed. So the, a running line change was we re-sparked. Now, every boiler that's out in the field has had a new board put in it that takes care of that. But on occasion, you may run into that pilot gas valve still being there. If it's still there, you can actually take it out and plug it. You can remove the hose and, and plug that as well. So um, you, you, really do that. you can leave it in place. It doesn't really matter. There's a shutoff valve. It's not doing much of anything. But definitely spending your time cleaning this burner, making sure that you've got everything cleaned out of it is really important for making sure that you get a good PM done. Now, that's the single burner model. or I should say the single blower, here's the dual blower. So the small blower is through these openings right here. The large blower is through in here. And then as we kind of get down into there, let me just get you guys a little better view, this up a little closer. So, you know, getting into that there, there is that shield and we want to reach in underneath and make sure that we clean that out. And that's that shield spot right there that's an important spot to clear because if we don't when our flame sensor that's here um, it may not read correctly all right so just important now the other thing that's important about the crest use a new gasket when you take that thing apart um, and put it back together you want to make sure that you are replacing your gaskets okay don't very rare can you reuse them, especially the burner gasket, that top cover manifold gasket on the dual fan model. On the single fan model, where that gasket comes out the very top, yeah, that's a, actually cool right there. It's not, it's not warm. You're going to be able to replace that gasket or reuse that one most of the time. But on any of the others, definitely replace your uh, um, thing. So Dave's asking, how do you pressure test the basically inside the burner and that heat exchanger? What you're going to do with that one is we're really looking for around that top plate, Dave. So again, we're pulling the pulse width modulation signal on the uh, boiler now on a on 110 single phase. That's the four wire. When we get into the, the the three phase, both of them are four wire, and it's going to be the smaller set of wires. So you're going to pull that one. My fan's going to go to 100%, and now I'm pressure testing my heat exchanger. So the advantage to the single blower model is where you took it off at the top there, it's a little easier fit back on. Um, we're not really touching too much. On that dual blower model, we're right down on the top of that heat exchanger. That's a hotter surface, and it's a bigger piece that I'm really trying to line up. So that's why it's really important right there, making sure we're not leaking anything out of that area that we're down in the combustion range. So it's just real important to do it. Now, I kind of mentioned earlier, downfire fire tube. This is actually one of the residential downfire fire tubes. And again, normally would sit right up, but in there we have all those openings that we're pushing down through. So there's just not a lot to it. Again, clean it. They were showing you, you can brush it out. You can use vinegar and water, that sort of stuff. If it looks like it, you can get a green scrubby in there. Crests are actually generally pretty clean burning inside of those heat exchangers. But you definitely want to take a look. You want to look down into those tubes and see what's going on. And then just a little closer up on one of our large gas trains. Uh, and this is, now this is off of a, uh, a 700,000 BTU. But this Venturi <coughs> is generally what you're going to see on the crest. Is this look to it here. I mount to my fan, pull my combustion air in through it. As it moves across here, I go across that orifice, that opening, I create negative pressure, and I'm basically just gonna suck the gas up through here. So that's just kind of a, a little look at it there. 
I want to slide over back to a video. I want to just give you guys a peek at the new control. If you don't have the new control yet, or you haven't seen it, or, or maybe you do. And that's going to be our smart touch control and just kind of navigating through it. And what it looks like, it, again, it's, you know, it's a slightly different version than what we have, but just take a look at that one there. The lock of our smart touch. Control interface. Well, we'll do seem to have a little bit of problem playing it. Let's just kind of walk through the control. So you really have the home button. This is the view to see other parameters. And then this is where you're going to do your setup um, in this one right here. It's kind of how that um, control is functioning and, and operating. So again, similar to what we had, but a completely different layout behind the scenes. Everything is really going to be the same in there. And if you change a a control nowadays, this is what you're going to get um, as your new control. You're not going to get the old one. I think we're I think we're actually stuck on the other end there today. Um, so that's really where that's looking like. The software versions here. At times, we may ask you which one you have as they're changing versions of software. That shows up here, and that is um, if you're connected. If you connect this to the internet, this control. It is automatically going to update that right there. Uh, there. Anybody have any questions at all? Uh, if you want to go ahead and, you know, unmute yourself and ask them. Dave, did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you. Okay. Um, anybody else have any any questions? Um, one of the things I will say about Crest, if you're working on one. If you reach out to us, we have the original startup forms. We're more than happy to get those to you so you can see what we did, where our settings were. But just really important, I can't stress it enough with a Crest, you really don't want to adjust the gas valves. Okay, They've been set and they've been tuned. But when we're looking at Crest, flame pattern, noise, that's what we're worried about. Definitely on the two blower model set, when you get to the single blower, you can actually treat that more like you would our FDXL or I think. But again, we're always looking at what's that flame pattern, what's that signal. With the with the single blower crest, we do a little more set those toward numbers. But again, what's your flame pattern? What's your flame signal? What's your noise? What's your CO? Then let's look at the numbers. The numbers last. Um, everything else first. So nobody's got any other questions. Um, I don't have much more here to to go with. So no questions. We'll, uh, you know, thank everybody for coming and, and spending some time today. And that's all I got. All right. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Rob.